welcome to another video from ExplainingComputers.com. This time we're going to return to one of my favourite subjects, which is solid state drives or SSDs. Today the cost of SSD storage has never been so low. However, manufacturers are using a number of techniques to offer higher and higher capacity drives for a minimum cost. It's therefore important to understand the different types of flash storage and their implications for SSD life expectancy, the role of SLC cache in determining sustained write speed, and the difference between SSDs with and without DRAM. As I've detailed in another video, today SSDs come in a variety of form factors and may feature many different physical connectors and electrical interfaces. However, all SSDs store data on flash memory chips in grids of cells that are grouped into blocks. Specifically, in most SSDs, the memory cells are NAND logic gates. Two technologies are commonly used, named floating gate and charge trap flash. In either, to write or program data, a voltage is applied to move electrons into a floating gate or charge trap. The presence of these electrons changes the resistance between the memory cell's source and drain, and this can be measured by passing a current between them. Whilst NAND flash cells can be individually written, they can only be erased in blocks. To do this, a voltage or field is applied to remove the electrons from the floating gate or charge trap. However, repeated program erase operations weaken the material cells are made from, which result in electrons either escaping a floating gate or being retained in a charge trap. After a certain number of program erase or PE cycles, it therefore becomes impossible for the cell to reliably function. And the practical implication is that all SSDs can only sustain a limited number of data write operations before they fail. The number of program array cycles that a memory cell can sustain in part depends on how much data it has to hold. Initially, all SSDs store just one bit of data per flash memory cell, which we now refer to as single level cell or SLC. However, to scale up capacities for a reasonable cost, multi-level cell or MLC was developed. This stores two bits per memory cell and does so by distinguishing two additional states between fully programmed and fully erased. However, as the cell wears out and electrons stray, it's more difficult to accurately distinguish four different states compared to two. And so, MLC SSDs have a smaller number of usable program array cycles than SLC devices. In turn, we next saw the arrival of triple level cell or TLC SSDs, which store three bits of data per cell, and then quad level cell or QLC drives that store, guess what, four bits of data per cell. Penta level cell or PLC SSDs are also now close to market. Given that TLC, QLC and PLC have to accurately distinguish an increasing number of partially programmed states, it's inevitable that they offer fewer and fewer program erase cycles. The number of cycles is different for consumer and enterprise hardware, and also varies between models and manufacturers. But as a guide, SLC drives can sustain up to about 100,000 program erase cycles, consumer MLC up to about 3,000, TLC somewhere between 500 and 2,000, and QLC between about 300 and 1,000. As another means of increasing capacity, SSDs are now often manufactured with many layers of flash memory cells stacked on top of each other. This fits more cells in the same space and is known by several different names, including 3D NAND and VNAND. However, it doesn't change the number of bits stored per memory cell, and so, from a user perspective, is simply an indication of an SSD's manufacturing process. In order to maximise their life expectancy, SSDs use a technique 
called wear leveling that moves data around the drive in order to even out program erase cycles. This occurs at the block level and can happen most effectively on drives with a reasonable amount of free space. So, if possible, it's wise to never have an SSD more than 90% full in order to make it last longer. Today, manufacturers usually express the minimum life expectancy of their SSDs via terabytes written or TBW value that inevitably varies with drive capacity. For example, if we have 1, 2 and 4 terabyte SSDs based on the same TLC flash with a minimum of 500 program erase cycles, then the 1 terabyte drive will be rated 500 terabytes written, the 2 terabyte 1000 terabytes written, and the 4 terabyte 2000 terabytes written. This highlights how today SSD capacity has become a measure not just of how much data we want to store, but how frequently we want to change it. For example, if you're purchasing an SSD to use as a system drive that will contain lots of program and data files that rarely change, then the 1TB SSD may be an excellent choice, as 500TB written equates to 100GB written every day for 5,000 days, which is 13.7 years. However, if you need to record and erase two hours of raw 4K video every day, then the one terabyte drive would hit life expectancy in 18 months, whilst the four terabyte model could last six years. To provide some practical examples, here I've got three one terabyte Samsung SSDs. The product names indicate that this 860 Pro Drive is MLC, or what Samsung term 2-bit MLC, whilst this 870 Evo is TLC, or what Samsung unhelpfully call 3-bit MLC. And on the end, this 860 Qvo is QLC, or what Samsung choose to label 4-bit MLC. And why Samsung cannot stick to standard terms is one of the many great mysteries of computing. Anyway, the 1TB MLC Pro is rated for 1200TB written, the TLC Evo for 600 and the QLC Qvo for 360. And sadly, whilst the Pro Drive will last longer as drive capacities increase, this is no longer deemed relevant for client devices. And so, like most manufacturers, Samsung sadly no longer make 2-bit MLC consumer SSDs. The speed at which an SSD can read and write data depends on many factors. As we can see, one of these is its interface, with drives using the most recent PCIe NVMe connections having the opportunity to transfer data considerably faster than SSDs which utilise SATA or SAS. This said, SSD performance depends on far more than its interface. For a start, cheaper SSDs generally have a lower IOPS or input-output operations per second rating. This measures how many different read and write operations can occur every second, and can vary from a few thousand to over a million. So, if you're comparing two SSDs to use as a system drive, always go for the one with a higher IOPS specification. Returning to SSD technologies, the more bits are stored in each memory cell, the slower data can be written. And because TLC and QLC flash write data far more slowly than most SSD interfaces can deliver, modern drives are equipped with an SLC cache. This means that the SSD has some flash memory cells configured to store just one bit of data, which can be written to far more quickly. So, the SSD's controller initially writes incoming data to its SLC cells before migrating it to slower TLC or QLC in idle periods. To illustrate this, let's copy 36 gigabytes of data to a 500 gigabyte Samsung 970 Evo Plus M.2 NVMe SSD. As we can see, things initially speed along, but 
after 22 gigabytes of data transfer, the drive's SLC cache is full and write performance collapses from its previous level of about 2.7 gigabytes a second. Things then take a while to settle, with the write speed finally stabilizing at about 800 megabytes a second for the remainder of the copy. Clearly, the more SLC cache an SSD possesses, the longer it will be able to write data at its maximum speed. And the larger the drive, the more SLC cache it will possess. For example, whilst the 500 gigabyte Evo 970 Plus we just tested has 22 gigabytes of SLC cache, the one terabyte model has 42 gigabytes. It's also worth noting that some SSDs now have a dynamic SLC cache that can expand by reconfiguring empty TLC or QLC cells as SLC. Thankfully, Samsung publishes the size of the SLC cache on its SSDs, something it labels as TurboWrite. But sadly, some other manufacturers do not reveal SLC cache size information. However, if the sustained high-speed write of many tens of gigabytes of data matters for your workflow, I would strongly advise obtaining test results to find out how large a drive's SLC cache may be before you purchase. In addition to using TLC and QLC, in recent years manufacturers have started to make DRAM-less SSDs. DRAM, or Dynamic Random Access Memory, only retains data when powered and has traditionally been included on SSDs as a cache to speed up performance as well as to store a map of data as it's moved around during wear levelling. But DRAM-less SSDs have no DRAM chips, which makes them cheaper and reduces energy consumption. However, DRAM-less SSDs still need to perform wear levelling and so first-generation DRAM-less SSDs store a map of drive contents on some of their NAND flash cells, so reducing the life of the drive. Until recently, if you purchased a DRAM-less SSD, you therefore got a cheaper drive, but also one with lower performance and a reduced life expectancy. However, in the past few years, DRAM-less SSDs from Samsung, Western Digital and others have started to make use of a new NVMe standard called Host Memory Buffer, or HMB. This allows the SSD to access some of the host computer's RAM via the PCIe interface, which means that HMB DRAM-less SSDs do not have a reduced life expectancy. They are, however, still slower than DRAM SSDs, although this only tends to matter for intensive applications like video editing or playing the latest games. But if you're not using your computer for these things, a DRAMless SSD do offer a good price performance trade-off. Today, SSDs from all major manufacturers provide excellent performance and reliability compared to drives from just a few years ago. And so, for general use, it often doesn't make that much difference which kind of SSD you choose. However, if you have specific life expectancy or sustained write requirements, it is important to pay attention to the characteristics of a particular drive. And of course, you've always got to be aware that no SSD is ever a permanent data store, and therefore to take precautions as covered in my video, Cybersecurity, Backups and Encryption. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon. Oh,